No Man's Sky was actually the worst. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Eric discuss achievements and their implications on the modern completionist mentality. Plus, Hearthstone's Monster Hunt, Hyrule's Doom, Clank, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, backward-compatible.com listeners. I am not Chris, I am Doc, and I am here for episode 129. What are we talking about this week, Jim? We are talking about um, this concept in gaming of I must have all the things. Uh, uh, wait, so, we're talking about memes? Yes, we're talking about yeah. all the things. No. All the um, things. We're talking about uh, completing, what does it mean to complete a game? Yeah. Um, how do achievements fit into that, really? It's a bit, a lot of it is, is going to fall into achievements, all of these extra things that games are expecting you to do. And frankly, you, I mean, you can complete, but very few do. The completionist mentality. Sure. Cool. Well, I am here with Eric. Hello. And I am here with Jim. Hey. And like I said, I am Doc. Chris is out this week, so we're just going to do our own thing. Uncut. Unedited. Well, okay, maybe not. Well, no, we'll, we'll do <laughs> editing. He, he, he can't get out of that. <laughs> but Our- first, the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. This past week... um. The new solo adventure At for the time Hearthstone. Of recording. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, the new solo adventure for Hearthstone released, um, and it's so good. It is very good. I know Doc has been playing it as well. I've been playing it, uh, and so I've been really excited to talk about this because yes. it's it's very very good. So, as a little bit of an introduction to what it is, um, what's also particularly interesting about this one, maybe they did this with Kobolds and Catacombs. I took a year off Hearthstone, so I'm not really sure if that's what happened. Um, they've Blasphemer. released. I know, right? Uh, Even I was so into it and just had to take take some time away. To be fair, so did I. I'm but very it was happy a to year be back. prior to that. It was, oh, okay. Yeah, I actually got back into it because of Cobalt and Catacombs. Oh, interesting. Yeah, cool. so that that for me was sort of a gateway back into the new forms of gameplay, which let's talk about. Yeah. So um, along with this, they've also introduced um, a new expansion for cards to be used in all the other they modes sure as have. well. Um, and then the solo adventure came out like a couple weeks yeah. after that expansion came out. The whole thing's called basically the Witchwood expansion, right? Yes. Is that, that correct? And yeah. then the, this new solo run is Witch Hunters? Monster Hunts. Mont- yes. Monster Hunters. Yeah. Okay. Monster uh, Hunt. And so the idea is um, very similar if you had played Kobolds vs. Catacombs. Um, it's essentially taking Hearthstone and adding a little bit of a deck building element to it. Definitely. Um, so what's particularly cool... there's no deck building element in Hearthstone. Right. <laughs> uh, and what's particularly cool about this time around, uh, there's four new heroes to play with. So they're based off of the classes that they have. So you, you have a mage... Last month, they declared they would never have new heroes <laughs> ever, ever. Did they really? They really oh, did. Well, and so now... So much t- for that. I know. Well, you know they were just toying <laughs> yeah. with us. Uh, So they have essentially based off of the four, like four of the classes. They have a mage, they have a hunter, they have a rogue, and they have a warrior class. But the special abilities are different. Yes. Um, And what's also particularly cool about that is we hop into kind of what the special abilities are, because I think they do some very cool things in how you actually play the game um, and create some very cool moments. Um, I I at least got to experience. Uh, It also, they, uh, they kind of play fast and loose with these hero or class specializations in that i'd agree with the that. the uh hunter hero for example has a lot of uh or i should say the um rogue hero has a lot of hunter abilities in there as well um which is kind of interesting as well yeah so. it's kind of a mashup i would say yeah um given that there are nine classes i should know that off the top of my head is that uh, right should i uh, yeah um the the fact that they've they've kind of combined the classes together 
has made some really interesting, I think, effects. Yeah. But of course, that was kind of always true anyway, even in in Cobalts and Catacombs, because what they give you is uh, a treasure and then three cards. Yes. And you can build your deck out from that. You know what? That, that mechanic actually reminds me of more than anything else is the idea of a, of a con um, or maybe a tourney where mm. you open packs. And I mean, IRL, you go, you're going to compete in the tournament and you have like 10 packs to build your deck with and you open them right then and you make your deck right then. Yeah. That's what it reminds me of because then you've got three options and you're like A, A B or C. That's it. What are you going to do moving forward? What's my overall strategy? Yeah. Um, and it also has a little bit of a feel with this sort of the, the paid, uh, what's that mode that I never play where you have to pay 150 gold? Arena. Arena. That's I am an, an arena, arena player. See, I'm yeah. not. Yeah. I hate arena. I absolutely what, hate arena. What you're talking about is drafting. Yeah. Dra- yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. drafting yeah. is the mechanic. Um, and, and so in that sense, I've never liked the draft mechanic for arena. I always build a terrible deck and I always lose <laughs> and I've, I've wasted my coin. But in this case... Uh, that's the core of the game and it's really, really fun. I don't know why that is. I think that a part of it is, so essentially you have eight challenges. Um, So the uh, story, if you will, that takes place during uh, this gameplay mode is that you are one, as one of these heroes, you are hunting monsters. And um, as you defeat each one, then you get an option for three new cards to add to your deck. So you Mm -hmm. start with, I think only like 10 cards and then it gets added on from there. And eventually towards the end, you have the full 30 card deck. And then every once in a while you get a special passive ability that does something like doubles your health or does some very cool stuff to mix around with your character. I love that. That's the one you thought of first. Yeah. Well, that's the one I always did. Me too. And I also enjoy the one that makes everything cost one more for Mm -hmm. the enemy. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that one's very helpful. I, I double down on that one. But part of the reason that I think that it works uh, in this in this example versus, say, Arena, is it's not entirely random. Um, the options that it gives you are uh, based off of a particular style of play or a style of deck. Um, and they even name them as such. So, like, say, for one of them, they call it, like, the uh, professional or the... Uh, a giant slayer or something like that, right? Um, and so then you're yeah. kind of following a particular theme as you're doing it as well. And so you can kind of do it intelligently. Um, and what it's really done for me is it's made me kind of wish as a big card game player outside of Hearthstone as well, big Magic the Gathering fan and a lot of other card games, it really kind of makes me wish that I could make hybrid decks that I could actually do like a mix of a rogue and a hunter deck because you find some of the amazing uh, abilities that you get to do through that. So yeah, that's, that's monster hunt. There's a lot of really fun things they've done with it. Um, Coming up with the abilities uh, for each unique hero has been really interesting to kind of change the way that you play the game um, and think about the game. Um, And of course, just the deck building element is fun in its own right as well. It really is. And I I totally got to brag here. I I have never actually managed to complete uh, the Cobalts run. I've tried and tried and tried. I just never managed to. But this time around, my very first attempt... I actually one shot at the whole thing <laughs> and actually beat all eight monsters with my very first try with my very first hero. Well done. Uh, and the Witchwood. And I'm like, yeah. And <laughs> I, of course, screenshotted the heck out of it, put it yeah. on Facebook. And I think I said, call me Wade Watts, a little reference to uh, <laughs> Ready Player One there. <laughs> but because he can do all the things. Uh, so I don't know. That may be my, my great moment. And now I can just die. <laughs> so I no, you have to defeat thing. with all four of them because then you get to the final challenge. Well, yeah, but I did it. My, my first try with one shot. Don't, so might as well. <laughs> don't downplay this, man. Don't don't steal my thunder. <laughs> Either way, it, it's really really uh, enjoyable, and and I think that it's nice. My actually my favorite aspect of it is that the timer has been done away with. You can literally mm. just walk away and uh, you know go do the dishes or change a diaper and come back to it (laughs) later and it will not penalize you unlike when you're playing with real people so um, that's actually my favorite thing about it because the reason i abandoned hearthstone back in the day was because i had a diaper baby yeah (laughs) he's potty trained now so woo (laughs) back to the ladder yeah indeed Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. I've been going on a little uh, nostalgia trip lately. Uh, I've been playing some Legend of Zelda, although I haven't been playing the original Legend of Zelda. I've actually been playing a ROM hack of the original Legend of Zelda. And there's actually several of these, and they have... um, Really, they run the gamut in terms of quality. Um, Some of them are 
really poorly made. Um, some of them are punishingly hard, so much so that it's not even worth playing. And then others are actually well made and challenging, but challenging in a way that's reminiscent of playing through the original game for the first time. And I'm playing one of those right now that falls into that latter category. It's called Hyrule's Doom. And it actually has this long uh, story that the uh, developer, um, programmed by a single person, by the way, came up with to sort of try to mix it into the the Zelda mythos. And honestly, I didn't really care that much about the story, so I didn't even read it. Uh, Apparently, it does take place a couple years after Zelda 2. But um, it is developed by one person. Um, He's known as The Three Dude. Mm -hmm. And um, he released it only... Um, a little over a year ago, uh, January of 2017. So it's a recent ROM hack, and I bring that up just to kind of point out that people are still making ROM hacks of games for the NES, still to this day. Um, Those madmen. <laughs> and of a game that is, um, of course, highly regarded in terms of the, the how solid the mechanics are of the original Legends of Zelda. I think it speaks volumes about that game. Um, so what I've, what I've enjoyed about this particular ROM hack Essentially, what it did was completely rearrange the overworld to an extent. It still has the same basic areas that you're used to if you've played the game. Um, Death Mountain is more or less in the same region. The desert is more or less in the same region. The forest, etc. Um, the coastlines. But some of what you find there is a little bit different, and especially the enemies are different. Um, where you find all the power-ups, where you find all of the dungeons are completely different. So when it comes to exploration, the game feels both familiar and completely new all at the same time, which I think is actually a pretty challenging thing to pull off, but um, he manages to do it pretty well. So I've had a lot of trouble finding some of these dungeons, and I've actually actually had to complete the dungeons out of order because I've just been completing them as I find them. Um, in addition, the You've game... have been simulating the original experience. I've been yeah. simulating the original Needing experience. Needing to have a friend who knows. <laughs> a friend who, whose dad works at Nintendo. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you I could wish, call the 900 I wish I had number. One. <laughs> I wish I had one. I mean, honestly, I'm at the point now where, um, you know, I've, I've beaten the first, the second, and the fourth dungeon, and I've found the ninth dungeon, and I believe the eighth as well, but I didn't go that far in the eighth. I, got, hmm. I went a little bit into it. But... Um, I did manage to find some items in there, but uh, some of the some of the challenges within the dungeon are really tough, particularly because they'll sometimes uh, he will sometimes place boss enemies as obstacles, not at the Triforce room, but earlier on. Uh, the dungeon layouts themselves actually tend to mirror the original dungeon, hmm. um, the original game, but the enemies and what's in the room and how the rooms connect to one another is different. So like I said, it's, it's, it, he's made this concerted effort, effort to make it feel like you're playing the original and yet that you're not playing the original, that you're playing a new, a new game. And that's what I feel to be the most um, fun part of it. I will say that it is very challenging. The way that he has the enemy set up, uh, the difficulty of finding some of the items, like for example, um, the blue ring or the power bracelet in order to move around in the world, it makes it a similar challenge to the second quest. So my guess would be because this is supposed to have a second quest to it as well. It's probably very, very hard. Um, but I'll see when I can get there. But yeah, yeah. I, I recommend it. People check it out. Uh, it's by uh, The Three Dude. And you can find it on um, your local ROM hacking site, which I won't point you to. <laughs> probably for legal reasons. But actually, I think, I'm think pretty sure they are legal. I don't know. I own a couple copies of Legend of Zelda on multiple systems, so I think I'm in the you, clear. You have supported this game. <laughs> Is that the cops? Including the original. I, I have the original as well. Black helicopters <laughs> landing on the roof right now. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So for the past few weeks, um, kind of on uh, Random Fridays, I've uh, gotten the opportunity to play a new board game that uh, at least is new to me uh, called Clank. Uh, It came out in 2016. Um, And Doc, I think that you've played it before. Yeah, it's a good one. I dig it. There's a lot that I really dig about it. So um, essentially some of this kind of what what, what it is to summarize it. Um, Essentially, you can play up to four characters and you do some dungeon delving. Hmm. Um, And so it's set up on a board and you start essentially at the top of the board and it kind of has a castle at the top and then it's essentially spelunky the board game and so then you go down well, that's and, a good way to put it actually huh. yeah and, and every player for themselves yes yeah okay. it is definitely a yeah competitive game um and you have cards and then that kind of allows you to either move your character into the next room or uh potentially need to fight uh uh 
uh, monsters that are down there because it has kind of a fantasy dungeon delving element to it. So there's dragons and goblins and things like that. Mm-hmm. What's particularly interesting about this game is it incorporates with the board game a deck building element as well. So everybody starts essentially with the same deck. And then, of course, then there's essentially a bank from which you can buy new cards for your deck for. And so kind of like typical deck building, you can kind of choose what type of deck you want to make, be it uh, if you want to focus on movement or if you want to focus on combat to be able to beat goblins or, you know, whatever you might run into in the dungeon. And then um, so everybody's building their own deck that they have the option of to buy from the same bank. And so you kind of get to get a strategy, but there's not really player interaction. It's really truly you against the game. And so you you can't directly attack a player. No, then. no. Um, Can you steal items from the player cards or be in you the same actually room can't uh, at least not from any of the cards that i found you can totally be in the same room but there's not any type of player interaction it's very much a uh player against the game and then whoever comes out with the most points at the end essentially mm-hmm. wins so that's where the competitive element comes in but there is a timer in this game if you will essentially what happens is there are certain cards or certain things that can happen that uh, cause you to have what is called clank which is essentially um just uh, your health, if you will. And uh, there is a dragon that essentially uh, is moving up the board that every single time that a thing happens, a certain card uh, gets drawn, Mm. that dragon attacks. And so anybody who has Clank, essentially their small color die that match with their corresponding color character, um, goes into a bag and then you draw a certain number of health out of that deck or out of that bag. Um, There's a certain number that was originally there for the dragon, so they're all black, versus then everybody else has a various different color. And you're pulling based on the number of Clank that you have? Uh, You're pulling based off of how long the game has been going on. So everyone uh, so, pulls the same amount? At the beginning. So okay. essentially, if, say, you and I have both had to take a certain number of health away from us, then you have, say, have three clank, I have two clank, those both go in the bag. And then at that certain point in the game, you're supposed to draw a three clank. You could pull three black dive, meaning that neither one of us get it. Oh, we I could see. pull one for you, right. one for me, so on and so forth. Okay. And as the game goes on longer, the more clank gets taken out of that right, bag at a time. Right. And of course, you uh, don't put in the black clank anymore. And so eventually, as you get towards the end of the game, it's only players' colors that are actually in there, mm-hmm. meaning that you're going to start taking more damage. So it is a little bit of a race against the clock. And then the last person, or I should say, um, so you go down, you can kind of get treasure and get very victory points and things like that and then one player can then decide i'm going to leave the dungeon and that's kind of where some of the strategy comes in in that not only is it a time uh, a race against time against the dragon and the game itself but it's also a race against everybody else once that first person leaves the dungeon then there's only a certain number of turns to be able to get out do they just declare i'm leaving or no they have to actually pathfind they actually have to go on the path on the way back out Um, but there are a few different routes to get out so you can kind of guess that somebody's going to leave the dungeon soon Uh, but it can happen pretty quickly exactly um and so of course there's a little bit of strategy in that and how how quickly you want to do that but one of the things that i find particularly interesting about this game um not only just because i find it really fun is the idea of reskinning games um just simply to get a completely different narrative out of it um one of the first times that i played this game with some friends one of the things that uh one of my friends brought up is this would make a really really great heist game and oh, wow. yeah and uh all that it would really take is for the game creator to probably just simply reskin it and mm-hmm. i'd be perfectly happy don't have dungeons have it be you know like a las vegas casino and it would totally work but they could also do a few variant variant changes on that to be able to have like certain characters or things like that that yeah, would fit totally that as well saying. yeah there's a game called the Z's that i've always wanted to see as a cold war mm. uh reskin yeah it's about tea time Okay. Like, like literally about tea time. It's about tea cakes and making tea and serving tea. But if it were reskinned as a as a Cold War nuclear thing, I think it would be brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And so um I know that they've done a sequel to this game called uh Clank in Space with exclamation points after each one of the words. <laughs> nice. Um but from what I can tell, it's largely kind of the same game with uh with, with essentially reskin in outer space. I would love to see them take a completely different direction and well, just simply just an, reskin it as a heist game. You know, there's another way work. to reskin which is to take the mechanics at their core call them mechanically val- ba- mechanically balanced values and uh you know just change the the meta 
mm-hmm. the narrative, the whatever. Yeah. So I, I you're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, I think it would work really well. And I know that Munchkin has done that through the years, oh, and I'm sure that there are other games that have done it that's too. That's exactly so, what Munchkin yeah, is. That's yeah. literally all Munchkin is. So if if the the creator of this game ever hears this, I I would buy that heist game immediately because well, I think that would be really fun. Big yeah. fans, yeah. <laughs> this is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. For um, Mobile Minute this week, I've played... Data Wing and uh, Data Wing is this, um, I would say, asteroids inspired racing game is the best way to describe it, I think. <laughs> um, Interesting. Cool. And so it is designed by and programmed by one person, Dan, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Voigt maybe, or Vogt. Um, he is Australian. And so I don't know how that helps with this name. He, the game itself is Just very mate. After. Mate, there we go. Um, is minimalist in terms of artwork. Um, you are a triangle. That's your ship. Sometimes there are other triangles that might race against you, and you have um, lines on the screen that are curved, and that represents the race tracks or the region in which you need to um, the course essentially in order to complete that level. There is a character that is sort of your like guide, similar to GLaDOS in personality, very blunt, direct, and instructs you, and you're not really sure if you can trust it or not, but it's kind of endearing. And it's done with just uh, two dots and a line for the mouth. So everything's very minimalistic. Um, the game itself is, per- is completely free. The mechanics are very simple. You tap one side of the screen to turn uh, right, the other side of the screen to turn left. Otherwise, you're always moving. If you touch both at the same time, both sides, you will break. That's it. The way that you race and the way that you gain speed is simply to drift along the edges of the walls. Hmm. And you pick up speed as you're doing so. It's a very, very simple game, very easy to play, difficult to master. Um, And like I said, completely free. Um, The statement from Dan is that he simply wanted to create a game that uh, people would enjoy playing and sort of as a personal project to himself, which is one of the reasons why the graphics are so minimalistic as well as the controls. Um, But... That's it. No, I, I'm actually kind of uh, pleasantly surprised to not find any um, hidden fees or anything like that. I've only recently found the game. I do plan to kind of hunt down um, Dan and see if there's a way that he accepts maybe some money. Maybe he has like a GoFundMe or something because I'd love to see other small projects like this coming mm-hmm. from him um, again. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. All right, gentlemen, let's talk about all the things. All right, we have a few hours, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the podcast that never ends. <laughs> uh, it, no, I, this is how this idea came about. We, as we were talking about this, we were thinking about the idea of 100%ing a game and what that means today. And uh, basically, Jim and I had a slightly uh, different definition of what that meant. I, I guess maybe I made an error or an assumption that... Um, Trophies or achievements, you know, achievements yeah. basically, whatever you want to call them, depending on your system, are expected to be a part of the game nowadays right. in order to do full and, completion. And they are also, they're definitely not just expected, they are required in a console game. I mean, you don't have a choice. You have to include them. I don't know. Oh, if you mean S- as a developer? Yes, as a developer. I don't know if Steam has that same, I know Steam does have achievements of some sort. I forget what they're called. I don't they're, know if they're they re- uh, trading cards. Trading cards. Yeah. I don't know if they're required though for Steam. Not technically. Okay. I know they're required for both um, PS4 and Xbox One. Yeah. So uh, trophies, achievements, whatever you want to call them, came on the scene about the same time that consoles went wired, um, meaning that they were on the internet. Right. And it really started, I think the big system that started it was the Xbox 360, as mm-hmm. I recall. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. true, actually. And, and then so, PS3 kind of picked it up. As you have a profile um, and your online presence is detectable by others, um, then... That makes some sense that you would look to see what achievements or trophies or whatever your your friends have done. Um, so my my theory on this, my thesis on this is simply this. Those were never intended to be something that were um, sought after. They were never intended to be something that were meant to be 100%ed. They were never intended to be something that were uh, achieved, so to speak, uh, as a goal. 
I think that really what they were intended and designed originally to be was, um, hey, we're going to reward you because you did this interesting thing, or hey, this is a, a hallmark thing you should tell your friends about. Uh, it's something that's associated with your profile because, wow, hey, cool, good job. Um, and I think instead what it's become is this weird sort of status symbol. Yes. And I wanted to to briefly touch on some of the the psychology behind um, behind achievements and and trying to look at some information, do a little bit of research into this subject. Um, I found unfortunately very little in the area of video games. What I found was um, similar research in the area of other similar um, examples of achievements outside of video games. What outside of video games are even doing this? So. Lots of things, actually, and really? the one that the one that I found that kind of struck home because I actually participated in this um, when I was a child, uh, the Pizza Hut Book It campaign. Oh, I see where you're going yeah. with this. If anyone remembers this, and, and Eric, you might have been a little too young. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's not ringing a bell. Um, there was this time where essentially Pizza Hut would reward you for reading. They gave you this button. Okay. It was the Book It Book It button, and you would get stars. For reading a book mm -hmm. and each book you would get a star and if you had a certain number of stars you could go down to pizza hut and they would give you a free quote unquote personal pan pizza of with course, the purchase of an adult pizza yeah i mean basically it was it was free <laughs> but you're a child your parents are going to have to drive you they're, right. they're going to want to eat something too yeah, yeah. It wasn't but it, getting your own pizza as a kid is special still, exactly yeah, and it yeah. came with a little i recall well the reason why i wanted it wasn't even for the pizza it came with an x-men comic Ooh. and some of them came with an x-men vhs whoa just to, for the old x-men 90 series so i wish i was really into so uh i was pretty motivated for this the problem here, and some psychologists have actually directly targeted the Pizza Hut Book It campaign for this reason, um, and, and specifically what they say is that expected contingent rewards, which is what this is, you're expecting to get a reward for something that is um, based on a certain rule that is outside of the actual task, in this case, reading. There is no real connection between reading and pizza. They created that connection. Um when you have expected contingent rewards, it reduces the intrinsic the intrinsic motivation to perform whatever task is being rewarded. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you start to associate reading books with getting a reward that has nothing to do with the with reading books. So instead of reading a book, this is this is of course you know psychology. Eventually, this could happen. I don't think it happened to me because I do still read for pleasure. But the um, studies that they had done on people that were a part of the book of campaign a lot of children they found that they were less likely to read when they got older and part of what they're um bit against people that you know were not part of the campaign and one of their conclusions was that this was because of this particular psychological process they started to associate books not with oh i'm going to read this book because i enjoy it the intrinsic motivation of hey this is going to be a good experience whether it's i'm going to learn something or i'm going to um just do it for the enjoyment factor or i'm going to um you know learn something about myself maybe it's a philosophical book or self-help book or whatever it might be whatever your intrinsic motivation could be to read instead you're doing it for something outside like some sort of reward that has no connection to reading you know an entirely different way to look at that data would be to say hey look they successfully got kids who weren't going to read mm -hmm. to read for that six months sure they did only for that six months and once the pizza was gone they didn't read anymore well, yeah but well, they wouldn't have been they reading were giving, at all Right. May, would they? So I, You're I making, think that that's at because the core they didn't of this target, discussion. Yeah. And here's the thing, though. I was already reading. Yeah. I already was reading. Uh -huh. And then they, then they, then my parents, you know, I got into it because I'm like, hey, I'm already reading. I'm going to go ahead and get some X-Men stuff, too. Some kids probably weren't reading, and they did read, did this because of this campaign. What they're suggesting is that because of this, it might have essentially taken away some of their intrin their intrinsic motivation to read um the re of course you can kind of see it's pretty it's pretty clear the connection to video games here and where i'm going with this mm -hmm. i think it's i think you can at least make the connection and whether it's fair or not i think that's what our discussion's about but i think you can definitely draw a connection here to achievements achievements themselves and this is why i say that you don't have to actually uh, complete all the achievements to quote 100 percent a game and the reason i say that is that i i find achievements to be meta they are outside of the actual game itself. Very much so. And in fact, it actually bugs me when I see a trophy show up on screen or an achievement show up on screen. That takes me out of the game. For Even though it's only there for a moment, 
Mm -hmm. It takes me away from my experience of I'm absorbed in this world. I'm playing as this character. Breaks immersion. It breaks the immersion because the achievement itself has like, yes, okay, I'm getting it for something I do in the game. But why would, in in my case, I've been playing Yakuza 6 still. So why would um, I go to a a restaurant and order Mm -hmm. every different food item on the menu? Why would I do that? So that I can get an achievement. But why would... Kiro do that no reason yeah so you kind of so like it's it's it's, you're doing it for you're doing it just to get something that has no real connection and a lot of times they don't even attempt to make a connection to the end game um older games where you used to want to achieve something special you had to do that on your own you created your own challenge right so so achievements have kind of replaced that i'm going to create my own challenge or i'm going to challenge you know eric and i are playing the same game and i say hey eric i was able to do this really cool um special move you know i was fighting these guys on a bridge and i picked up this one guy and i threw him off the bridge with my special move bet you haven't seen that before and i'm actually referencing an incredibly rare heat move in yakuza 6 that you Mm -hmm. can only do in one situation based on one like a a set of circumstances has to occur and so you didn't even know about that back in the day because there's no YouTube to show you that it's there and there's no game fact forms or anything. So I tell you, you can do that and you go, whoa, I can do that too. So you run out and you go try to find a, a sort of circumstance in which you can do it and you, you know, you find it, you come back and you go, hey, I did this, mm-hmm. you know, and we kind of have that one upsmanship and oh, oh, but I also found this other one and when you could do this, right? So it's, there's still, we have that sense of accomplishment, but it's completely based on our experience in the game achievements on the other hand the developers are saying and usually it's very lazy it's like Mm. eat five different food items here um run a thousand kilometers you know total in the game do you know like i mean the world of warcraft ones are some of the worst they're like so you know basic and repetitive and no man's sky was actually the worst yeah i didn't even play that one but very (laughs) very grindy right a lot of times the achievements are very very grindy grindy. or just based on even the laziest are the ones like the lego games do this actually where it's literally just story based ones um so if you do just complete the story then you've gotten them all um so it doesn't yeah. even try to make them I'm actually separate from the game. I'm totally okay with that. I actually am I okay think with that, that too. that goes back to the original intent, sure. which is to say, hey, how far did you get in this game? And let all your friends see, wow, he beat that game. That's neat. Yeah. So I guess that then my question then would be, um, because one of the, because as somebody who's not a, uh, what I believe would be called an achievement hunter you or don't a trophy like pizza, hunter. That's what you're telling us. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, okay. Well, I've never gotten an offer for pizza for my video game playing. Right, but no. hey. and you never got offered a, you know, <laughs> X-Men VHS. And so I just never got into video games because yeah. of it. Yeah. I'm gluten dairy free. That was my excuse. <laughs> um, so I guess that my question for that then, though, is um, because on one half, as somebody who doesn't follow, doesn't really embrace achievements really a whole lot. If there's a game that I really, really particularly like, I might go back through and try to get as many as I can, but I don't really try to platinum a game on, on right. PlayStation or anything. I've honestly never done that either. But there is a culture that has popped up. Yes, there is. That is very interested in doing that. And so much so that they that's actually the reason they play games. And they're mm-hmm. wrong. They're deeply, deeply <laughs> well, wrong. Well, there we go. That was the question I was getting at. Um, I sensed that. Yeah. <laughs> and so I guess the way that I look at it is for particularly lazy uh, trophy design or gameplay design or achievement design. Sorry, I've been a PlayStation yeah, player yeah. for a while. Um, then they can be either frustrating or get in the way of and break immersion or just kind of be boring in their own way of knowing that like um, sometimes it can take you out of gameplay of knowing if you know that, oh, I should probably order everything on this menu in this game yes. because there's probably an achievement for it. Mm-hmm. And now you almost feel bad that you haven't done that because it's like, well, now there's a thing the game's telling me I should have done that I'm not doing. And and sometimes the if they tell you what that, you can go in and you can look at like the name of a trophy yeah. or achievement. Sometimes they, sometimes they block it out. Yeah. But sometimes it can spoil actual plot points of a game. Again, it's true, yeah. Yeah, and so it can be designed badly. Right. But for games that I think that when done well, um trophy lists can actually be really good and really interesting because they can actually provide an entire separate reason to play the game outside of the game itself um and so i guess that i guess my question being in a game that does that particularly well it's a really cool and interesting trophy list in which the designers they actually had the game designers think about how do we actually come up with fun trophies for the ways that we know that people want to play this game 
either first playthrough run or for people who want to do trophy hunting that's completely separate from the game itself. Does that then still detract from it? And do you dislike the fact that achievements exist at all? Or is it just a different way to play games? I mean, personally, I, I actually think that it does take away from the game itself. I actually do think that it detracts from the um, the motivation, the desire to actually play the game as either, whether it's a story game or an action game or whatever the game is intended to be, it puts you in a different mindset. So those people that are playing the game to complete the trophies, they're playing the game for a different reason. Sometimes then you know, that I'm playing it for, but also sometimes then it was even designed for initially. No, totally. Because it's not always the same team. A lot of times it's not that comes up with the trophies versus the game itself. Um, I don't know which, which game you're thinking of that has really well-designed trophies. I haven't run into it. There's many. Really? Could you name one that Uh, I may have played? Oh man. Um, so, so we can argue about it. (laughs) Yeah. No, just as somebody who doesn't necessarily follow trophies, but like a podcast that I follow regularly, they are very big into trophy hunting. And so, one of the things that like they used to do when they would talk about a game release is let's look at the trophy list as well. Is mm-hmm. this a good list of trophies? Um, and then they would actually go through on like what was successful, what was not. Right. Yeah. That's so. kind of neat, actually. Yeah. No, no, that's 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 really neat. And I, I just um, to me, I feel that um, I've always felt it cheapens the experience. But again, this could be because I'm from an earlier era of yeah. gaming. Yeah. yeah. And I always felt. For me, I'm going to find my own challenge in this game, regardless of whether there's a trophy for it. Mm-hmm. And today, I feel like gamers don't do that because the developers have done that for them. They've decided, um, oh, you're going to beat this beat this boss without taking a single hit? That's a trophy. It used to be, oh, I'm going to do that because I'm challenging myself. So, the develop, so there might be other things that are not related to that. For example, um, the um, no heart challenge, three heart three heart but basically no mm-hmm. additional heart challenge in legend of zelda there's no trophy for that sure there's no there's no extrinsic benefit to that you're choosing i'm going to play this game in a certain way and the only the only, and no one's going to see it by the way if you tell someone that you did it um no one's there's no proof like yeah, guys give it time yeah like mm-hmm. good old games for example they have they have effectively trophies for old games right but that's that's an interesting proposition as well, yeah. where it's like actually change the yield back to a game that didn't have trophies. Because I think honestly that achievements and trophies have actually changed the way that some developers approach game design. Well, I think very that's very so. true. So, and, and to me, maybe that's, I don't know if that's one of the reasons why I um, have so much trouble getting into some, a lot of modern games, particularly bigger modern games. Um, but I, I, think that's part of it is because there's a different approach the way that they approach mm-hmm. game design and i don't think it has anything to do with graphics or anything to do with controls i think it's the approach and sometimes the approach is a little bit too much focused on on trophies on achievements on um this sort of collect collectathon nature of uh, games that i've never really been into i'm not necessarily saying it's bad i'm just saying that for me i've never really been into it i'll be devil's advocate for a minute here okay and say that the only game Chris I've, isn't here yeah <laughs> uh, the only game i've ever 100 percented was vice city okay yeah and i mean the hardest part about that one uh was actually like the ambulance missions mm-hmm. and that that yeah. kind of a thing um but and, how, how did you know what to do in that game Without well, trophies or that's achievements. Where, that's where I was going with that, actually. How'd you figure that out? Well, hold on. Before you get too <laughs> haughty, there there was a screen, yeah. a sub screen that told me what I had succeeded in and what I had right. not succeeded right. in. They were not online. They were not online enabled because the system was not online enabled. But guess what? They were achievements. They were trophies. Oh. They were private. In a way. Local goals which is really all that that, that is, um, especially when there's a list of like, do a hundred X, right? Mm-hmm. And I've been playing Fortnite and I got to say that the way that that entire game generates stars, which is how you level up through the, the levels in a particular season, is by doing what are basically micro missions. Oh, you lost? Well, of course you did. There's 99 other people on that, you know, that are trying to kill you. But... In the process of losing, did you do a cool thing like uh, land in a named zone uh, six times? You did? Cool. Have a star. Did you um, deal a thousand damage to other players? You did? Here, have a couple of stars. Those are in-game 
local achievements. Nobody cares about but mm-hmm. me. So I think the difference here is that after the the level of the game or the whatever is over, you can check the screen, you can see how you've done. But um, one of the things that you complained about just a minute ago, Jim, which to be fair, I think is a valid complaint, is that it broke immersion by popping up on your screen and going, ding, trophy earned. Right. And in those cases, it usually, sometimes it does, but it usually doesn't do that. It stays behind the scenes. Right, right. And, and I think... And, and I, that's also a developer's decision. That you is a developer's decide decision. When, I mean, there are, there are games out there that actually don't pop any trophies until the end credits roll. Yeah, that's... That's I, a really good point. I found actually. that to be pretty rare, though. I don't know how many. No, no, absolutely. But yeah. I, I guess that again, I see what you're still saying. playing I, devil's advocate yeah. to you. Trophies can be done correctly. Sure. I I wish that um and may, if there if there is, please tell me. I I didn't haven't really you know found it. But can you just turn them off? Yeah, absolutely. Where do you go? At least on PlayStation. Where you do can. you go? Uh, you it's in your uh settings. Okay, I'll check that out yeah. later. Yeah, that, that's, yeah that's you can make it thing. so it never pops up. Cool, because I. I hate it. Yeah. So I will do that when I get home. Yeah. First thing, but no, um, I think that's that's a good point with the with the Vice City. And I was, I think that for those, it's very similar. I think that's kind of like a nascent um, leading us to achievements concept. Mm-hmm. Really, that's just a list of essentially everything you can do for the most part. Like it's all the different missions, right? It's like you got these ambulance missions, the fire truck missions. Yeah. It's it's like telling you here are all the, here are all the things because. Um, with a game that is as big as GTA, I think in that case, I'm just trying to think. Go, get, put myself in a developer's mindset. They spent so much time on all these side quests and all this additional content. I'm sure I'm sure they were thinking, some of them were thinking on their team, um, what if people don't find this content? What are we going to do? Yeah, right? what if nobody realizes we, they can take a taxi? Exactly, because yeah. they put so much time into it, which, which with so many people playing, it's a silly concern. Someone's going to find it. Really it. Once they do, they're going to share it. Right. But there's still that there's still that worry. So I think that's where the completion list came in in the first place mm-hmm. for, for that is like that's a, we're going to we're going to encourage people to do it. And I think that was sort of the the bud that led us to achievements. Right. Um, where I think achievements. That was my point, actually. Yes. And I think that's a good I think it's a good point. Um, so I think we've kind of talked a lot about just achievements in general, but I kind of want to spend just a few minutes touching on kids. And the reason why I want to bring up I was going to say playing, the same thing. Yeah. I want to bring up the concept of, yes, okay, we're all adults. We're choosing to get in this, et cetera. But these, this could also, in theory, again, be a manipulative practice to, um, you know, for, for children to get them to play longer, longer time, um, potentially doing repetitive tasks that may not necessarily be, that might be extending the time they spend with the game, but it may not necessarily be leading them even closer to completing the game, as in, getting to the final boss in game state mm-hmm. they're just grinding something to get an achievement so as long um, as i'm playing devil's advocate let me throw this out there sure. as adults we have the freedom to buy these 60 70 dollar games pretty much at our leisure at a rate of approximately oh one or two a month conservatively a kid does not necessarily have that christmas rolls around and you're like bang, I actually got three games. Sure. These are the games I'm playing next year. Um, so what you've got is a kid, this is a terrible example, but a kid who's got, I don't know, Dead Space or something, right? Uh, I actually observed this a couple of years ago. A friend of mine, his kid, only had a couple of games, but one of them was Dead Space. And as a result of that, this kid knew every single tip and trick. And he was going through the hallway, uh, crunching zombie heads. And I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, oh, sometimes they come back to life. So if you stomp every one of them, they won't. And he was willing to take the extra half hour it was going to take of that level in order to crunch every zombie head so he wouldn't waste ammo before they came back to life. It was a workaround for him. And that's the crazy thing is I would totally not be willing to do that. But he was. Why? Well, because he needed an extra way to play that game, which was one of his three, which he had beaten literally 12 or 13 times all the way through. As a part of his new way of playing the game, he also had gone through and sought all of the achievements, except for a few. And I think that there's an argument to be made there, which is that we are creating a new game space for playing, even though it is meta, it's still a game. It's a gamification of a game oh, it definitely that is. has already been 
beaten and played and replayed mm-hmm. and memorized and beaten again. It's an, it's an additional... It is a meta it's a game, but it's an additional game. to do yeah, sure. that has, sure. let's call it the stamp of validity on it of, oh, the dev says I can do this thing and it will be cool. Excellent. I'm going to go do this thing and it'll be cool. Right. Um, and so, but yeah, but talking talking to that kid angle and it does give them that extra sort of option. Um, and one of the things that kind of led me to this topic in the first place, there's been some outrage among parents because of the recent announcement and by recent it's been it's been a little bit about a month by the time this airs um from netflix that they're adding patches to children's shows i had not heard about this yeah. until you started talking about it and it's it's kind of experimental thing and they got, they've gotten a Is lot it of backlash only children's shows seems to be yeah Oh, so oh, it's the pizza thing all over again. It's like Ooh. it's like book it, yeah. And so the way that it's working is that's that a different caveat it's now. and it's also yeah. for binge watching specifically. So you actually earn patches for consecutive viewing, longer viewing, etc. Um, and so it's encouraging children to binge watch through the use of patches, almost like training them to binge watch. And if you're you've been following Netflix and their marketing strategy and the way that they market. Um, shows all of their new the new content whenever they have a new show they release all the episodes at once it's all centered around encouraging viewers regardless of age to binge watch joke the camel all over again so it's almost like with these patches it's encouraging children to become binge viewers binge watchers um now i don't necessarily i'm not necessarily saying that this is some sort of insidious thing that i've 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 seen some people say i think this was just their way of thinking oh this could be a fun thing for kids to do that are already watching however it might have that effect it could have some of these negative impacts but what i wanted to talk about more so because we're a gaming podcast is why do you think netflix announces it and then almost immediately parents start freaking out and yet we've had achievements in Xbox um, 360 that were huge among gamers since what well, when the Xbox 360 came out, maybe like 2005, 2006, and nothing. I mean, we don't hear about it from parents. I have an we don't answer hear to that. About... It's probably totally wrong, but sure. I have an answer about that. Ironically, even though there's the, the, the whole pushback about video games being too violent or whatever it is, there is a positive element to video games. And it's simply the kids are doing something. And so there's this almost like subconscious reaction to it where it's like, what would I rather have my kid doing? Staring at a screen for 10 hours or playing video games for 10 hours? If those are literally my only two choices, I'd rather my kid be doing something interactive that they're actually progressing through something of their own action as opposed to just turning into a TV zombie. Now, they're both terrible choices, but I think that there's, I think that's the answer is that if, if we're really just saying we're encouraging our kid to sit in front of Netflix and just watch it for 10 hours, but don't get me wrong. I watch a lot of kids television because I have a four-year-old uh, right. and, and when he's not allowed to binge whenever, whenever we watch something, then uh, after three or four episodes, it pops up and it says, are you still watching show? And so when that happens, mm-hmm. he knows that's when we're turning it off and we're going to go read a book and we're going to do something else. That's his, that's his little time limit, if you will, mm-hmm. um, for I, the shows that he mm-hmm. admittedly has memorized because he's got his favorites. I wonder how I – ha, I haven't seen all the information about it. All I've really seen is honestly all the reactions. But – April once Fools. they once they roll this out completely, because I don't think they have. I, honestly, I haven't seen it. I doubt they will. I haven't seen. Um, in other words, I haven't seen the patches like show up in either, any program yeah. that I've watched. Nor have I seen it. You watch a lot um, of kids television, Jim. Mm-hmm. Not really, but I'm I'm trying to think. There are a, a few shows that I watch that I think could class like could potentially be like they're they're kid friendly enough that yeah. maybe they could put them on it. Well, you know what's going to make me laugh is when all the anime gets slapped with it. And people maybe are I mean I don't know, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but my, my question would be like, what if, let's say it becomes that thing where, you know, you're watching, um, you know, a show and, you know, with your kid and, mm-hmm. and then it pops up after those three episodes instead of, hey, are you still watching? It's like, you know, achievement hey, earned. achievement earned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that would, I think, have a very different impact, don't you think? Yeah, it would. And I, I, I don't know. I'd have to agree with the naysayers. I think it's a terrible idea, but, but I'm not then, even, that's like a gut reaction. So, so I don't even know why then, I think that. Well, but then let's extra- extrapolate that to games. The exact same thing happens that, you know, playing for say, 
you know, an hour and you get the achievement unlocked or whatever it might be, um, or you're, you're playing and as you're playing, you're consistently getting achievement unlocked. Um, yeah, but encouraging you to play, you get that. Cause the, the idea here well, is that those when you are get, so arbitrary and stupid though, well, that we just ignore them. Also, those we achievements, ignore them, well, but those, <laughs> those achievements also sense. have nothing to do with the amount of time that you've played. Sure. Right. Sure. But they, but they also, I don't know. And they don't. They don't directly, but they definitely do indirectly. indirectly. They, they do. They definitely sure, do of indirectly. Course. But at the same time, as well, um, a parent just knows if a kid enjoys a game, they're going to play it. They're going to hit fifty hours on playing a game, be it over the course of like a month or over the course of six months or a year. Um, and because everybody has their own favorite games that they'll want to play. Yeah. Um, and actually, like Doc, you brought up a really good point regarding like coming up with new ways to play a game because you played it so many times as mm-hmm. a kid because you don't get to choose what games you really get I to know own. I know I did that. Um, I mean, I, there's actually yeah. like a, a popular YouTuber, uh, Gerard the Completionist, um, mm-hmm. actually says that that's exactly why he started to complete games was because his parents wouldn't buy him a new game until he could prove to them that he had finished it. And then as games started to change over the years, what finishing meant changed because i mean with sonic the hedgehog right. 2 that was you hit the end credits later on that wasn't necessarily the case and then as he started to make a you like thought about i want to make a youtube channel what would i actually do he realized he has completed every game he's ever owned that could be a thing and so in this in the frame mm-hmm. of this discussion it's also a fascinating youtube channel to watch because he actually has various definitions on what it is to complete certain games based on um if he actually gets all achievements or sometimes those achievements can't actually be unlocked because the multiplayer and the servers have gone down. Mm-hmm. Um, or if he doesn't touch achievements at all, if it's just a story completion. Sometimes they're well. mutually exclusive too. Yes, very much right. so. You have to do multiple playthroughs sometimes yeah. to get all you the You got to do the evil run and then the good right. run to get them both. No, that's yeah. very, that's very interesting. And I think that um, completionist, completionist gamers have always been there. Yeah. So um, all the way back from the early days, it's just that, what we might consider a complete game has changed, I do think. But also, sure. I think that there's not one answer either. So, like, I wouldn't even count. Like I said, I don't count achievements as part of completing a game. Sure, and and but I think some that completionism do. is entirely a subjective thing. Right, you know? exactly. Um, it really maybe at one point in time wasn't, but it has now forced I, to be. I, I mean, I kind of think it always has been yeah. because even when you're talking about a game like. Um, and, and maybe with Sonic the Hedgehog, it's a little more straightforward, but especially a lot of open-ended games, like say, um, you know, a lot of RPGs, yeah. a completionist run might be, you know, if some of your party members say Fire Emblem, for example, if some of your party members can die and on that run, a completionist, or you, 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 some of the recruitment is optional, a completionist mm-hmm. run would be you've recruited every single character that you can recruit and they all live to the end. That right. would be a completionist run. For example, to use that example. So it's very specific to the game, I think. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that actually in all the examples that we've brought up, there are various versions of it. Like in Sonic the Hedgehog, it would be, um, did you just simply get all the way through it to the credits or did you get all the Chaos Emeralds and unlock Super Sonic as well? There you go. Those are two different versions. Uh, With Final Fantasy games, it would be, did you just get to the final end credits or did you get every Omega weapon or Mm -hmm. Ultimate weapon or something like that? Mm -hmm. And now that we have achievements as well, then it would also be that on top of it and so i guess that that's kind of the way that i do largely look at achievements again when done right is it's just another way to play the game or another way to completionist and i will, and i actually game. agree with your with your statement there i think i think of them the same way i think of it as just another way to play the game another way to approach the game i just just don't die, like using them yeah but i do agree it's another way to play the game i don't think that it's for me i don't really connect it to completing the game mainly because so many of them are like they're related to what you do in the game, but they're always require you to do some things that are kind of grindy for the only the only reward being achievements. And I know that sounds kind of weird because I actually like old games in which you have to grind. Like I love sure. Final yeah, Fantasy yeah. One and you have to grind so much in that I mean, at certain points in that game. And yet I don't like grinding for achievements. So another, it's kind of <laughs> another <hypocrite>. perspective <laughs> that actually I think we could take on this as well that I've heard before is that some people, and I've actually felt this way myself, is that some people uh, don't necessarily try to get all of the achievements, platinum a game, if you will, unless they really, really enjoy that game. That's and a good it's point. kind of a way for them to show the developers that like they really appreciated them for making this game yeah. and that they wanted to show that to them for, you know, as a thank you for making the game that That's way. That's an interesting way to look at That's, it. That is. And, um, 
is that something like if is that something that people say like yeah. they actually yeah, say yeah. that interesting mm-hmm. i've never and actually i even feel even that myself that. Huh. um like i've never actually like i i have on uh, xbox but like i i've never actually platinumed a game mm-hmm. on playstation um the game that actually i really want to do that with is with dragon age inquisition Partially because I'm close enough to actually being able to do it. I just have to do like a nightmare mode run and then make a few cho- choices based on like romance and stuff like that. But for the most part, I could actually do it. And a part of it is because I love the Dragon Age series enough that it's kind of a way to like show that appreciation for myself, like like for the game. But then also because people can look at my trophy list to show like, yeah, when I talk about how much I love DA, this is an example of it that I did go through. That's fascinating. That. So, um, so I think that that's another perspective to take on it as well is that, um, they put them in for a reason. Um, and it's kind of a way to show, if you will, like it's your, it's your fan club membership sticker, if you will. Um, it's the way (laughs) to show that like, yeah, I adore this game and it's just yet one more reason that I can, it, one more avenue of which I can do that. Yeah, it, it definitely gives them a different approach. I'll say that to to replay in a game because mm-hmm. I go through and I've I've replayed. I mean, games that I really like, I replay them multiple times, and I, I have several games that I do that with. Um, and I straight up don't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. literally, well, I'm, I can count on one hand sure. the games I've beaten more than once. No, it's like for me, and a lot of them are. To be honest with you, because of I have, it feels like I have less time to play games now, and now I also have <laughs> That's more also money. Being an adult, right? Yeah. Because I'm yeah, I'm adult. As, as a kid, I of course played a lot more and i had a similar situation where i didn't get games all the time so the ones that i had if i liked them i kept playing them right um so i've beaten the original final fantasy um maybe oh geez i don't even know 10 times maybe Mm -hmm. i don't know legend of zelda i've beaten that Mm -hmm. i can't even count how many times zelda 2 i've beaten that ton of times i mean um there's a and and metroid i've beaten metroid several times so a lot of those nes games in particular but um other games like you know chrono trigger i've beaten chrono trigger you know at least five or six times so that's kind of how i personally sort of when i'm looking at how do i say oh yeah this is a game that i really love and i've played a lot it's usually if there's multiple paths has like have i gone through and taken some of those paths but also how many times have i beaten it i don't even think of things like achievements but again that's because i come from like an older style mm-hmm. gaming like when i when i look at for i didn't even think of that perspective of some people thinking oh yeah this is a good way to kind of show to a developer how much i love the game it never crosses my mind because they get to yeah. see Sure, how but many people but they, have finished it. But they yeah. also see on, especially something like Steam, they see if you've put like 200 hours into a game. Sure. If you've put 200 hours into the game, but you've only completed like three achievements, that also says this person must love this game if they yeah. put 200 hours into it, right? So I think there's a lot, a lot to that as well. Um, there's a lot of different ways to play the game. And I think that's kind of what we've been talking about is a lot of different ways. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the effect that it has on play, it definitely has had an effect. I mean, we oh, can't, yeah. sure. we can't say that it hasn't. Whether it's good or bad, I, I think it's still up in the air and, and probably subjective in a lot of ways. Yeah. That's one of the things that I find particularly interesting about this discussion. And it, it feels like we've kind of hit at it a, a few times kind of at the core, especially for you, Jim, is... Mm. The fact that, like, even a game that nece- doesn't necessarily have achievements, but does have, like, it keeps track of what you've done throughout the game. Um, it, it seems like the fact that it exists, um, the achievement exists, or the fact that there is something in the game, like you brought up Vice City, Doc, mm-hmm. um, that the game is telling you, here's a thing that you can do, you almost feel like you are now being told by the game to do it because you are because it's there but you are being told by the game to do it now you don't mm-hmm. have to listen but sure. because if the game says um you know you've completed three out of five uh ambulance missions mm-hmm. that's giving you information right there oh i'm supposed to do five ambulance missions yeah now you don't yeah. have to nobody's forcing you to yeah. but no one's forcing you to play the game either so sure. i feel like achievements are guiding the way that you play in a way that the that is it's outside of the game. And I feel like mm-hmm. anything that, that you are... And yet, for you, it's also still totally a part of the game. Because for it me, is. I can separate the two. Yeah. I, I can complete oh, I, the game. I ignore I don't them. Don't get me wrong. Care. I ignore them as best I can. Yeah, but it still but does also, affect the way yes, that you... I also feel, feel like yeah. it's it does encroach on me sometimes because of how... And even like the way that they're, they're incorporated in the game, like even in Yakuza 6, um, on, your, on your little smartphone app that you have there's like an awards button as part of it. 
so you can open them up. You can see it like it, you, you also, in terms of not just getting a cho- trophies, but you also get extra stats based on certain things that you do achievement wise. Mm-hmm. So it actually mm-hmm. has, you know, gameplay benefit too. I mean, they, they obviously put a lot of time into it. I'm not necessarily saying they've even done a bad job with the achievements. It's just for me, I don't, I don't appreciate it, I guess, yeah. like some other people do. Well, one yeah. word I didn't hear you use was influence. As in, it influences the way that you play the game. and I think that's fair, yeah. It, it doesn't influence the way I play the game. I don't look at, I don't look at trophies or, or achieves. I don't care what they are. When they happen, I'm, I kind of passively dismiss them. Mm-hmm. Um, it really doesn't bother me at all. But maybe related to this, and if this might indicate where I, in, what, in what place I play games, if this makes sense, um, the, like every Fallout since the beginning... I have overloaded my pockets and my carry weight until I was all but immobile and then would like slink my way to a place where I could actually dump it or sell it. This last playthrough of Fallout 4, which was my second playthrough of Fallout 4, I absolutely forced myself to think of it as a role play Mm -hmm. instead of, um, you know, a crunchy game mechanic. And so unless there was a reason for me to look in a locker, I ignored them all. And the irony, the deep Hmm. irony, this was a huge lesson for me, was that I never wanted for ammo. I never had problems with, um, you know, being weighed down. And I always had enough money because instead of turning it into some kind of weird economics lesson, it ended up being something where I was going more places, finding more random things, more better things. And instead of scrimping for pennies, I was actually selling major items I didn't want to use. And in, instead of, you know, building a, a, a secret fort full of all the, all the cool weapons that I was mm-hmm. never willing to sell yeah. and then selling 10 cans to try to buy ammo for it. Um, I think that not, it, that had nothing to do with achieves. Yeah. I think that was almost for something like that too. It sounds like, cause I played Fallout 4 as well. And mm-hmm. it feels like that's just the game itself makes it far too easy to scrounge and, um, have enough ammo, have enough weapons, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, compared to even like Fallout Three or New Vegas, right? Well, that that's but very much a community, especially too, compared so. to Fallout and Fallout Two. I mean, I, Fallout. If you don't, if you're not looking for stuff in, in the original Fallout, you could very easily run out of ammo. Yeah. The world of the easily. Commonwealth is a lot more populated and, and dense in that sense. There's a lot more people to encounter. I guess right. I'd say. I just mean like the sur- the survivalist attitude of Fallout. Yeah wasn't there as much in four, yeah. which well, is why I think you can get away with that. There's well, a survivalist mode. Literally. I found that as a wonderful analogy, actually, mm. Doc, for kind get... of what this conversation is in that what you did is going through and scrounging and trying to collect everything, even if it was kind of a grind, is kind of the way to play a game if you are focusing on achievements. Yeah. Um, as opposed to then just kind of you came up with a new way to play it which was also just kind of the way that you wanted to play mm-hmm. that particular game, possibly ignoring and not necessarily gaming the game right. uh, with this metagame element. Right. Um, you were kind of doing the reverse. Yeah. 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 And, and that's exactly. why I wanted to tell the story. Yeah. Is that so I think it works. I think it was stemming out of the fact that I p- first played the very first Fallout, uh, I think it was like a sophomore in college. And that, I mean, that was revolutionary gameplay for us back then. And so um, I, I just sort of assumed back then I needed to get all this stuff and sell it. And, and that's how I played right. it. And so I played all the fallouts that way. And I decided to reinvent how I was playing fallout. And it became this amazing story about this woman who would do anything to get her child back. And I felt like that was the story they were trying to tell that I had completely missed because instead of focusing on the narrative and role playing it, R-O-L-E playing it, I had instead gone in with the attitude of, excellent, it's Fallout. I love Fallout. Get out of the way, story. Well, you were doing the the, the classic pick up anything that's not nailed down. Yeah. Which yeah. I, I do as well, admittedly. Yeah. I, I would actually be very... The game. Yeah, not, I'd, I'd be yeah. very curious to see how that strategy would work in, say, the original Fallout. You should try it, man. I don't think it's going to work. Yeah. I don't think so either. Not at but, all. That's know. kind of my point. I feel I don't think it would work in New Vegas, by the way. It might not. I don't think it would work in New Vegas. I think I they know. made four so simple... That in terms of when I'm talking about when I say simple, it, it was easy in all ways, but also in this in this way in particular. Fi- make Keep in mind, folks, he has not actually played it. I have played Fallout Four. Have you played it Fallout Yeah, 4? we oh, talked yeah. about it. Remember? No. How disappointed I was in no, it. And no, I don't. <laughs> how, how how I was extremely disappointed and thought it was a step back even from three. Uh, okay, in terms of the role playing elements, the dialogue choices were terrible. I just remember you predicting you wouldn't like it. 
So you set yourself up for failure and it wasn't a real playthrough. There you go. Okay, sure. Gaming the game versus (laughs) playing the game. Dig the Uh, hole deeper. Yeah, regardless. Dig the hole Um, deeper. But yeah, to kind of take us around uh, to kind of put a cap on this discussion about, um, you know, achievements and completionism and all that. I I certainly think that they've influenced the way that we play games, but I, and also that they've influenced the way that some designers at least design their games. Yeah. Um, That's the thing I would be the most worried about. But at the same time, there are some truly inspired and genius game designers, (laughs) one sitting at this table, uh, who I think aren't going to be influenced by it. And because of that, I don't think we have anything to worry about. Not really. Sure. I could see that. And, yeah. um, um, and then maybe, maybe next week we'll talk about, um, some of the other horrible practices from, <laughs> from gaming, like, uh, loot boxes, microtransactions, loot boxes now being banned, for example, in some countries, uh, recent news on that. Um, everything's not happy yeah, I'm and sunny. I washing my hair that day. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure that we don't end on too positive. Enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, well, well taken, Jim. <laughs> Any final thoughts, Eric? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that just like anything in design, um, it's important to, um, to, to imagine what, what the effects, uh, any system that you have in a game is Mm -hmm. going to have on the way that somebody's going to play it. And of course, on the experience of what it is to actually play the game in general. Mm -hmm. Um, I am, I think that at its core achievements are good, even as somebody who doesn't necessarily do them. Um, and because it, allows more people to come up with interesting ways to play your game that they might not have thought of before. Um, And so I think that really the important thing to remember is that anytime you add anything into your game, uh, it's going to affect everybody who touches it, whether or not they interact with it yep. or not. Right, um, right. And so it's it's important to remain cognizant as players and as developers on that. Yep. I agree. Fact. That's that's a great statement. And I feel that one thing that we haven't touched on enough, and I'll just kind of let it hang and maybe we'll get some feedback from our our listeners um we touched on it only very briefly is the concept that sony and and microsoft require you to have achievements so we keep talking about how oh designers can do such a good job with it and they certainly can Mm -hmm. and sometimes they don't and we also said oh it always can influences the way that people play at least to some some degree and yet even if you feel like your game doesn't work with achievements and you don't want to include them you don't have a choice yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so I'd love to hear from from listeners that maybe have some thoughts on how that might impact um, game design, how that might impact a, a designer who's, you know, they're trying to put a game together. They they don't feel like it adds anything, and yet they're forced to add achievements, trophies, what have you. Okay, well. Fight the man. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us for uh, the backward-compatible.com podcast for this week. This was episode 129 in our talk on I must have all the things, achievements and, and whatnot. Um, I'm Jim. Modern completionist mentality. Yes, cur- yes, exactly. And he's still Jim. I'm still Jim. And I'm still Doc. I guess I'm still Eric. Maybe. For now. I think. <laughs> all right, see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Compatible.